So here is our agenda for today. We have a feature presentation starting momentarily. Um, we also have somebody from the province who's going to talk a little bit about the local perspective. And then we've got lots of time for question and answer and we'll be all wrapped up before 1 p.m. So just before we get into the main presentation, I wanted to share a little bit about our organization in case this is the first event of ours that you've attended. We're a not-for-profit society established in 2006, and our whole mission is to improve invasive species management within the metro Vancouver region of BC. And we do lots of different things. We answer questions, connect people to resources. We host regional events like this. Um, of course, before COVID-19, a lot of our events were in person. Largely, our events are all online right now. We develop a lot of resources, support and train staff and stewards. We have a very small seasonal crew specializing in some of our really high priority invasive species. And we also provide consulting and do work on special projects. And I am delighted that I work with many of you on the call today and my thanks for your support of our organization. So I next I'm going to introduce our guest speaker and um, then I have a, a quick poll that I want to do as well. But I'm gonna introduce uh, Jimmy first. Actually, I'm gonna stop screen sharing for a moment. Um, so Dr. Jimmy Taylor is a supervisory research wildlife biologist and field station leader for the US Department of Agriculture's National Wildlife Research Center. Um, so that center is the research component for wildlife services, a federal program that resolves human wildlife conflicts. He's stationed on the campus of Oregon State University where he holds courtesy faculty appointments in wildlife and fisheries, forestry, and animal and rangeland sciences. His research is conducted at the Human Wildlife Interface and focuses primarily on defining impacts and developing strategies to reduce wildlife damage. His research often includes overabundant species and species of concern, and he is going to be sharing all about Nutria today. So while we're waiting for him to pull up his presentation, um, I do have a quick little poll that I'd like to launch for you, and that is, have you ever seen the Nutria? So this would be a live Nutria um, anywhere. Yes, no, not sure. <laughs> Hopefully after today's presentation, there'll be less people that might have uh, might have said not sure. So I'll just give it a couple more seconds for people to complete that poll. As the host, I am not able to want to vote in the polling, but for me, it would be a yes. Um, but I haven't actually seen a Nutria in BC. I saw it when I used to live in Oregon. So I'm gonna share the results with you. So it looks like one, um, that doesn't include me. Two of us have seen a Nutria, most haven't, and a couple of people are not sure. So interesting. Great, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing the poll results and I'm gonna um, turn it over to Dr. Jimmy. Thank you so much for being here. I'm happy to be here, Tosh, and thanks so much for the introduction. Um, you saved me a couple minutes of uh, covering my background, so I appreciate it. Um, it's good to be with you all today. Um, as Tasha said, you know, I, I work with human wildlife conflict resolution. I don't consider myself really an expert in Nutria, although I've worked with them. I've done some research on them. Uh, they're pretty interesting animals. I want to share today a little bit about their basic biology and also talk about some of the management that is ongoing and has gone on in the United States with maybe some recommendations or implementation implications that is um, for British Columbia and other uh, areas in Canada. Let's see if I can advance here. Okay. To get started, I'd like to just make a few quick acknowledgements. One, uh, Dr. Trevor Sheffields was a graduate student at Portland State University and I was on his committee. Um, we've published a few papers from his dissertation research and some of the slides that I'm gonna show today were shared by him, so I just wanna thank him for that. Um, Marnie Pepper is a, another wildlife services employee and she manages the Chesapeake Bay Nutria Eradication Program for Wildlife Services. And you'll hear more about that later. And then the three following uh, hyperlinks or websites are just where I grab some material, some of which is about 
our management efforts within wildlife services in collaboration with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS. Uh, these will be recorded as part of the presentation, so hopefully you can access those later if, if you're interested. Also, the last slide of my presentation will have my email address, so if anyone has questions that they think of later or we don't get to today, please feel free to give me, uh, send me an email and I will respond to those as soon as I can. To start out, let's just talk a little bit about the species Nutria. The, the term Nutria actually refers to the pelt that the Nutria provide um, in other countries. So outside uh, North America, um, they're referred to as Koipu, uh, the, uh, taken from the Latin name, Myocaster Koipus. And they're native to South America, generally the, the lower part of South America. Um, around the turn of the 20th century, uh, there was this interest in expanding the fur market. It wasn't really a great idea, um, as you'll see throughout the presentation. So it didn't really catch on, and then the, the species were released into the wild, they became feral, and uh, they're really incredible at reproducing, as you'll hear about later, and expanding their range. So this was, this was a bad idea from the very beginning, and it's something that has continued to be a problem and caused a lot of econo economic and ecological impact uh, where the species exist. It's considered an invasive and exotic species outside South America, and they have become established in at least 30 countries on four continents. They were said to be eradicated from Great Britain in the 70s and 80s. I haven't really done any fact checking on whether that uh, is accurate as of late, but I can tell you they were claimed to be eradicated in the state of California in the United States, and that did not happen because uh, as of late in the last few years, there's been a real surge to uh, reduce damage caused by Nutria. And our wildlife service program is involved in that along with the state and other federal agencies. Within North America, the species has been introduced or expanded into about 30 states in the lower 48. Um, and as you can see here, these are just hot spots of where uh, recordings of Nutria have been collected by the USGS and provided in this map. Um, the management of the species differs by state and by region. And I'd like to just point out here three major areas where management um, has occurred or should occur. Um, starting from east to west, in the, in the New England states um, around this, the states of Delaware and Maryland, that's where the Chesapeake Bay eradication program is going on. And you'll hear more about that throughout the presentation. Um, that's not the only place that nutria occur along the East Coast, but it's a primary area where they've really done a lot of damage to, uh, to marshes and wetlands. And so there is an eradication program there. Conversely, in coastal Louisiana and areas of the Gulf Coast of the United States, there are a lot of nutria, but there's no effort to eradicate them. There's actually a bounty program in, in Louisiana that's gone on for several years. And when I last checked, albeit not very recently, it was $5 per nutria tail. So there was and has been for a long time an incentive really not to eradicate the species because people make money by shooting and trapping the, the nutria and, and receiving the bounty payment on them. So that's very different than an eradication program, which has the intent to remove uh, the last breeding pair from an area. And then even different from that, as we shift over to the Pacific Northwest and uh, the states of, of uh, Washington and Oregon specifically, where I live, there's almost um, an acknowledgement that they're there, but kind of a blind eye approach that there's really no management effort to, to manage for them or eradicate them. With the caveat that um, they are considered for bears there you know people can harvest them if they get the trapping license and abide by the state laws and try to get something for the the fur if they do catch them even if they may be um, incidental catch as they're trying to catch otter or beaver or something else um, but if they are caught within the state either for scientific purposes or recreationally states like Oregon and Washington ask that they be um, lethally uh, killed or, or dispatched so that they're not released back into the population. So just 
three regions, very different approaches, very different effects from those. As I go through the presentation, I'm going to talk about some of the things that are unique to Nutria, uh, not really unique, but unique to invasive species. Um, and as I mentioned, they are invasive. Uh, they're very adaptable to a range of habitats. They do need water because they're semi-aquatic, but within that, they can occupy a lot of wetland areas. Uh, they are herbivores, but they have a very generalist diet. Um, as you'll hear more about later, they are very prolific and they really have few natural predators. Um, the one thing that does seem to limit populations of nutria is cold weather in the winter. And if it gets too cold, um, it tends to keep nutria from persisting in those areas. I'll talk a little bit more about that later towards the end of the presentation when I uh, briefly talk about some habitat modeling. Um, they also are able to disperse quickly and they definitely cause a lot of ecological and economic damage. So nutria do breed year round. Um, females can breed up to three times a year and when they have offspring, uh, the average size of their litter is four to five, but they can have up to 13 individuals per birth. Um, so they, again, are incredibly prolific. And within 48 hours of the female giving birth to a litter, she can become viable again and breed again. Um, and so, you know, that lends to the, the three litters per year. When the young are born, they're very active. They have most of the fur on them, so they can thermoregulate very quickly. They do nurse for up to eight weeks, but they don't require um, just the mother's milk for uh, nutrition because they can eat very ed, vegetation very early in their life, and they can also swim very quickly. Um, and then the young become sexually mature within four to six months. So you can imagine the potential for exponential growth within this population if there's not something that's limiting that population. This is what a nutria looks like on land. One of the ways that you can quickly identify nutria from other uh, vertebrate species of similar size is the hump appearance. Um, this is um, just a normal nutria, but that's just the way that they look when they're, they're standing upright on land. So, you know, from a distance, you could even pick this out um, and differentiate from a beaver or, or some other uh, furry, small to medium sized mammal like that. They're about two feet in length, um, and their tail is about another foot to foot and a half, 13 to 16 inches. It's a round tail. It does some have some hair on it, but it's not completely uh, furry tail. They do have a whitish muzzle and whiskers, and that's something that you can use to readily identify one, and it really differentiates it from other species. Um, they have a generally large excuse me, light to dark brown color of the fur, but there are some melanistic uh, varieties that occur in populations. They can uh, be more yellowish or, or reddish, um, even um, uh, white fur, but this is generally the appearance uh, of brown fur. They do have prominent yellowish to reddish incisors, which look very similar to a beaver. And again, the hunched appearance is very uh, diagnostic of the species. They are semi-aquatic, as I mentioned earlier, so they have some features that other semi-aquatic animals have. They're able to close off their, their breathing and their eyes with specialized valves so that they can stay underwater for a long period of time. Uh, the average weight for nutria is about 12 pounds, but females uh, will reach weights up to approximately 18 pounds and males about 20 pounds. So they can uh, get quite large. And this is just a, a chart on the right here to just show the relative comparison in size to some other, um, which maybe mistaken with. So they are generally smaller than beaver and river otter. They have a, you know, a different side profile as you see here. Again, that, that humped appearance on land really gives them away. However, if they're swimming in water, it can be very difficult to tell the difference between a nutria or a beaver possibly even a river otter, depending on how far away you are. Groundhogs are not semi-aquatic, but just a relative comparison for size. If you happen to see them out in an area where the two species coexist, they're also confused many times with muskrat, but they're, they're uh, considerably larger than muskrat. And again, um, 
there's there's some subtle differences in in body mass and uh, just the the general profile. Another interesting characteristic about the nutria, I, and I just I really find this super fascinating, is that the females can nurse the young while they're swimming in water, and that's because the mammary glands of the nutria are raised up um, further on the body, actually on the sides. Um, so it's it's really crazy to see this, uh, to even think about it, but it's just an adaptation that they have that allows them to take care of their young and keep moving and keep away from predators. And, and the young can actually feed while the mother is swimming. So uh, that's pretty unique. To this direct identification, there's some other things, um, not really fun to talk about uh, over dinner type things, but uh, you know, we can look for fecal droppings of the species. A lot of times this is really something that you pick up on, like if you're in a park or an area and you may be not seeing the species uh, of nutria, but these, these droppings are about two inches in length. Uh, they're dark greenish in color. Um, you can see here for comparison, uh, the, the size relative to the Swiss Army knife here. Um, they do have rounded points at both ends. Um, they are found on land, which is different, say, than a beaver that defecates in the water. And they do have small longitudinal grooves in them, just as if, you know, if you needed another point of uh, identification that also exists. So these are pretty diagnostic of nutria. Um, as we look at their tracks, there's also some interesting features about the, the forepaws and the hind feet. The forepaws uh, have four digits only. Uh, they also drag their tail a lot when they're walking, and if they're going through a, a moist or wet area, that's pretty characteristic. You don't get the, the large, broad appearance of, say, a beaver tail. And the outer digit on the hind foot is not webbed, which is uh, pretty interesting of the species as well. There are other ways that we can identify them indirectly, and those are the things that you see here. A run is, is just simply an area that they use. Um, so the, the vegetation is worn out by the, the nutria dragging themselves up and down and through these areas. They also create uh, extensions uh, within wetland areas where they can forage out. And so they will, they will create these burrows and runs to uh, access other places. A burrow is a little bit different from a run, but these are, are combinations of, of ways that they get around to uh, <clears throat> excuse me, get to their, their den site or from their den site to a foraging site. Um, you can also identify them through nesting and feeding areas. So in the upper right hand corner, you can see a couple of different areas um, where, where they fed. One, um, the area that's more green is just an area that they've eaten out. So they've just stayed in this area and foraged and foraged and foraged until they've uh, just denuded this area. Uh, they don't only eat the the um, upper vegetation, but they will also eat the roots and tubers. And so they will consume almost all of some plants. And so that kind of makes feeding sites a little bit different to differentiate from, from burrow sites in some cases, because in the burrows, uh, in the example that you see here, the burrow on the right, they've actually done some foraging in here on the, the roots of this vegetation. So, um, it's kind of a combination sometimes of feeding and, and burrowing. And then again, when looking at damage, again, just be reminded that it's not just above ground damage that they do, but uh, also underground. In general, there are four different ways that we see nutria conflicts with humans. Uh, the first three that I've identified here are all related to their feeding and burrowing activity, and that's generally damage to agriculture, damage to property, and da damage to natural resources. Natural resources may include, um, you know, damage to um, a, a wetland habitat, for example. And then the standalone category is human health and safety concerns, and I'll talk a little bit about each of these in some of the following slides. Ways that we observe the feeding damage, again, um, some of these slides were used uh, previously, but they do forage above ground, they do forage below ground. When they damage woody vegetation, they also make a 45 degree cut on the woody vegetation. 
similar to a beaver or it's similar to other, some other species. And so it's often important that when you're diagnosing whether you have nutria or don't have nutria that you look for those other signs because the examples that I show here are, are nutria damage, but they could easily be confused with a beaver. And so you wanna look for the, the slides and how the slides differentiate from beaver and look for the tracks and the fecal material and other things that would be more characteristic of a nutria versus a beaver or vice versa. And there's really no one thing that nutria damage when they get into a wetland system. Uh, they will damage native species. Um, and you can see some examples here. They damage private property and they damage agriculture. And this is, a, again, a combination of them directly foraging on the, the vegetation itself or uh, undercutting the vegetation as they burrow in roots and tubers and so forth. So they're not they're not limited by any uh, one particular, or they're not, they're not favoring one particular type of, of vegetation. Again, they're very generalist. And where we do see damage reported in restoration sites, it's been reported that they damage uh, in excess of $400,000 US in areas where restoration efforts have occurred. Um, so it's, it's uh, an area that, um, is really of concern because as, as you're aware, we're trying to restore a lot of areas that have been uh, going in the wrong direction. And when, when time and effort resources, including money are invested in these, um, we don't need uh, nutrient competing with us. Here are just some more examples of uh, the burrowing activity that they, they do and how this causes bank instability and severe erosion. Uh, Trevor, who I mentioned earlier that um, I worked with on, on doing some research for his PhD is standing in the image on, on the left of the screen. Um, you can, can get very deep and very long and lead to a lot of uh, uh, compounded problems. Again, the damage that they cause by burrowing is not specific to any one thing or, or one area. They do damage on land to water structures and infrastructure. And when this happens, it also can be very, uh, have a, a high economic impact in, ex in excess of $300,000 per event when infrastructure is damaged. The image here is, is uh, a home that was along uh, a wetland bank and the constant foraging and burrowing of nutria into this area undercut the foundation. And this was uh, a tremendous amount of damage to this property. Lastly, uh, human health and safety, again, is a separate issue. And this is one that people like, ten, they tend not to think about as much, but nutria are potential reservoirs for several zoonotic diseases. In Oregon and Washington alone, they've tested positive for the examples that you see here. And there's certainly several more. Um, where this really becomes a problem in, in my eye is when people are just naive to nutria coming up to uh, take food out of their hands or for their, their toddlers to pet them and things like that. These are actual not staged photos. Uh, this occurred in the Portland metro area in, in Oregon. And it could be very dangerous. Um, you know, these nutria can bite, they can become very aggressive. Even though they may not seem aggressive, but sometimes they can be, especially if they're conditioned to getting food from humans. So this is a real concern, especially now that we're in light of uh, how zoonosis can affect us globally. Uh, this is a real concern. Um, where nutria are managed, it's mainly with lethal control in, in an effort to reduce populations or eliminate populations. And there are different ways to do that. Um, I've identified three here that are pretty common baiting, trapping, and shooting. Um, many times they're used in an integrative approach, um, not just one technique, but multiple techniques to, to try and get the best effect. Zinc phosphide is a bait that, that is used for, um, for managing nutria. It does require a certified applicator license. It's often viewed um, as, as um, a potential for non-target risk, although um, those risks are very low and they can be mitigated by 
um, by using techniques through that we've learned through research chances, such as um, elevated platforms and and things like that. Um, there are different types of traps that can be used to lethally remove nutria, foothold traps, body gripping traps, um, cable restraining devices, and the efficacy of these can be improved by things like pre-baiting sites. And those options depend on locations. Uh, some regulations don't allow lethal trapping. Um, I'll show you an example of uh, some non-lethal traps in just a moment, uh, or at least talk about those briefly. And then shooting is another way that uh, individuals can be removed from the population. Again, as with everything, there are concerns over the tools and techniques that we use. And lead obviously is a concern when, when shooting is used. Um, because of the accumulation of lead in an area and then the, the secondary consumption of that by birds and animals. So um, if one were going to be using lethal control by shooting in an area, I would recommend that they use non-toxic um, shot to do that. There are not a lot of non-lethal techniques or tools to reduce nutria damage. However, one of the studies that we did as part of Trevor's research was to look at the efficacy of VEXR tubes uh, in restoration efforts. And we conducted this study in the state of Oregon. And we did find that, that VEXR tubing was efficacious in reducing damage by nutria where we were um, uh, evaluating streamside restoration. Um, it, was, it was much more effective than not tubing the seedlings. We also contrasted different ways to uh, trap nutria with different live capture techniques. We used a modified multi-capture trap uh, which we built and we evaluated this against commercial traps uh, that are also um, non-lethal but they're single traps. We didn't find a difference in the trap success in comparing these. However, we did find that there was much less uh, non-target species captured in the multi-capture traps. And with some improvements that we recommended, we think that we could even increase the efficacy of those traps and have multiple nutria captured within the same trap. The problem that we ran into that made it less effective was we had individuals that would go into the trap and then get out of the trap. And so with some improvements to door design and also um, slightly reducing the mesh size around the base of the traps, we think that we could uh, improve these even more. And those might be useful in an area where traps need to be left alone for a while and you want multiple individuals to enter the traps and stay in the traps and um, and where lethal control is is not allowed with trapping so um, moving along i'd like to talk really quick about the nutria eradication program that i mentioned earlier um, again this is in the delmarva peninsula in the states of delaware and maryland um, the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge is about 5,000 acres of wetlands as part of that complex and a lot of damage was noticed there and then when, uh, when uh, research and management expanded beyond that, they really found like it was a, a significant threat to the Chesapeake Bay area. And so a collaborative of about 25 partners or more got together and began intensive management on nutria to, to eradicate them. Our Wildlife Services Program is part of that, along with other federal and state partners and nonprofits. The entire Chesapeake Bay Nutria Eradication Program cons uh, consists of about nine watersheds that were affected. Uh, this effort has led to the protection of over 250,000 acres of wetlands uh, for over 400 private landowners. And the eradication program seems to have been successful, although they are not stopping. Um, they're continuing to monitor for nutria, but the last one was taken by this program in May of 2015. Um, the saying that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words really uh, is true here. I, I love these contrasting images. The one on the left is from 1938 from the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. And for point of reference, you can see um, close to the lower right hand side, you can identify the same wetland uh, within a wetland. Um, so these are the same areas taken um, years apart. In 1938, this was um, before nutria became a problem. And then by 2010, nutria were well established and they have uh, totally removed 
much of the wetland habitat in these areas. So in, in the image from 2010, you see a lot of exposed water and shallow mud flats and really poor um, marsh health in this area. And that is due to nutria. This is a more local shot of a wetland uh, within the same general area. And this image was taken before 40 nutria were removed from the area through this management program. And this is two years later. And so if, if you can get in and take care of the problem by removing the source of damage pretty quick before a lot of erosion has taken over, um, you can get quick recovery of these species, uh, the, the plant species that is. This program also uses canines as part of their program. Historically, they use canines to um, facilitate their trapping efforts. So they, they would bay nutria with the dogs and it would improve the success of removing the nutria. However, as they began to get really effective in removing nutria, it became cost prohibitive to maintain uh, a large kennel of, of hunting dogs. So they rethought the, the needs and they partnered with the dog training center in 2014 to begin using dogs as identification dogs um, by basically sniffing out nutria scat. And they currently have um, one trainer handler and five other handlers as part of this program. And it's really paid great dividends. Um, another way that they're improving detection is by using hair snares. This is a really simple device that you can make at home. Um, you, you put it up in common areas where Nutri are using them. And as an example here, we're, we're showing a monitoring platform that has hair snares on it. Um, they did a study on this in 2013 and found that um, it was very effective in increasing the probability of detection. So along with dogs, other non-lethal techniques like hair snares, they're really, um, they're getting really good information about the occupancy or not occupancy of nutria in the Delmarva Peninsula. Another thing that they've done is to partner with Landcare Research in New Zealand to look at uh, occupancy modeling with their, their large data set to improve the statistical competence um, in their eradication program. Um, getting close to the end here, I, I don't have time to go into this research study, but just another thing that came from Trevor's work was some modeling efforts to look at the potential expansion of nutria and this paper is available um, if you'd like to, to go find that and read the details of this. But again, as I mentioned earlier, um, hard winter weather seems to be something that um, could limit nutria populations. And so with modeling efforts, they, look, they use the current uh, climate change models to predict the potential uh, range expansion of nutria. And they found that there was an association with um, with winter temperatures and as winter temperatures are predicted to increase, so are the ranges of nutria. And how this would relate to British Columbia, as you see here on the, the figure on the right, as these temperatures are predicted to increase within the next 50 years, so potentially would the nutria population from Southwest to North and, and uh, Northeast throughout uh, the, the province and even into other uh, provinces potentially. So um, it is a concern and I think, I'm, I'm not sure of the status currently of nutria within your area, but I think you as well as others, including uh, refinement of, of some programs that we're doing in, in the United States, we have the opportunity to address this um, as we are also dealing with a changing climate. Now again, these are just the same priorities that I would give to anyone. Uh, British Columbia may be well ahead of this, but I just, I wanna throw in that caveat that I'm not suggesting, you know, that these things aren't being done, but these are just some recommendations um, that, that I would give to you or to anyone that I'm giving this presentation um, of some things that have worked and continue to work. And one is really public education. People need to know that, that Nutria are out there and they are, um, you know, destructive invasive species. And there are some informational resources that are available that you could uh, share with others or create on your own. Um, improve monitoring efforts, really get the public involved and increase coordination with stakeholders in the US. You know, um, the people that are managing the Nutria eradication program would be happy to share tools and techniques and, and uh, success stories and what they've done. 
And if someone were interested, all they would have to do is contact them and ask. There's also an example from Skagit County, Washington, where Nutria um, were identified and the stakeholders, the local public really got interested in this. It's an agricultural area that um, they really wanted to protect. And they were successful at eliminating or, or locally eradicating Nutria from a small area. Um, but again, this project or this study needs to continue monitoring just like the, the project in the New England states. Um, once you think you've eradicated them is not good enough. You have to keep up and, and make sure or the problem could come back again. So another uh, a strategy would be to develop or join an existing regional plan. And with that, I apologize if I've gone over time. Um, it's a lot of information, but I, I do wanna uh, try to answer any questions that you may have either now if we don't get to them today, uh, please feel free to give me a uh, shoot me an email at the address below um, in this slide, and I'd be happy to uh, answer your questions. Great, thank you so thank much. You. That was excellent. And um, no, we've got plenty of time for presenters and questions today, so that's no problem at all. If for some reason we do run out of time at the end. Um, maybe you can answer some questions by email and then I can post those on the website to share with everybody afterwards. Um, but I do want to hold off on questions until after our second speaker, but feel free to pop those in the chat if you're thinking of them right now. Um, so next I'm going to invite Emily Lomas to uh, present. She's a terrestrial and basic fauna specialist with the BC Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. And she is here to, to tell us the historical distribution information on Nutria, a bit of the history in BC, and results from surveys that her ministry did in 2017. So I'm really glad Emily could join us today to provide a bit of a, a local perspective. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Tasha, and thanks, Jimmy. That was a great overview and presentation about Nutria. Um, you can hear me okay now? Yep. Okay, great. So yeah, I'm just gonna spend uh, five or 10 minutes talking about the situation of Nutria and BC, a little bit of the history, a little bit of the work that's been done and where we are at now. Um, it's really gonna be a pretty brief overview. So if anybody has any further questions or follow up later, um, I do have my email address and, and Tasha will have my contact info. So please feel free to reach out to me at any time. So as I said, this will be a quick overview. Um, I'm also going to talk about a little bit how we prioritize our invasive species and where Nutria falls in there as well. And like I said, a little bit of the history, the occurrences, some work that's been done, and then um, obviously the importance of report, reporting, excuse me, not just uh, Nutria, but other invasives as well. So the BC Interministry Invasive Species Working Group, um, they have uh, an early detection rapid response advisory committee. And so we use science-based risk assessment processes, uh, processes to, to determine uh, where we prioritize animals and where they fall along um, this grid here you can see on the right. So, and the priorities help determine a few things, but among them, the management actions. So Nutri had a risk assessment done in 2015. Uh, they were determined to be obviously high risk, and that's for a lot of the reasons that Jimmy was talking about. So the fact that they can be established here, they could spread um, their potential impacts, and then also the feasibility of eradication given their uh, low numbers. So they were determined um, to be high risk and also in the prevent category. So that's where they still are currently. And as part of creating this risk assessment, um, we also have some information online for the public to, to see all about Nutria. We have these invasive species alert sheets. Um, so this one is online currently for, for anybody to take a look at. It has a little bit of the info that I'm going to be talking about too, as well as the biology. Um, you will see it updated um, in the next few months to reflect just a new template, so it'll match a few of our other ones, but the information's the same, and I encourage you guys to take a look at these alert sheets if uh, you're not familiar with them. So the history in BC saw that the first nutria was introduced uh, into BC in the Ladner area in 1938 or around there. And we did have fur farms for nutria up until the 50s and 60s. The last ones were actually closed in the late 60s. So they haven't been actively farmed 
in about 50 years, so or over 50 years um, here, but that's likely how they were introduced. Um, and obviously that with the fur farms comes both accidental and intentional releases as well. So occurrences, um, as of uh, 2015, uh, they've, that, well, this, uh, this map comes from 2015. So just to give you a little bit of a background on that. Um, they have been confirmed in BC. Uh, populations were confirmed starting in the 90s uh, on Salt Spring Island and in the Lower Mainland. So it's thought that also there's likely other smaller populations, but not much is uh, known about them. So you can see here in this map, and you can also look it up on the, the alert sheet too, that we have what we're calling historic occurrences as well as um, present occurrences. So the historic are kind of, you know, prior to 1965. So, but we do know that as of the 90s, um, there was a confirmed population at Salt Spring and in a couple spots in the Lower Mainland. However, there are a couple of occurrences there that um, some subsequent work has gone back to, which I'll talk about in a second, um, and determined that actually those sightings may or may not have been Nutria, so that's just something to keep in mind um, as well. So in uh, 2017, my predecessor uh, received a grant and, um, sorry, I just got a little bit of a lag there. Okay, so yeah, in 2017, my predecessor received a grant um, to do some surveys for Nutria in those areas where we had those confirmed populations in the past. So there's two uh, consultants who were hired for the different areas, so the one on the island locations and then ones in the lower mainland, uh, basically where they've been reported in the past and also uh, where we believe there was suitable habitat in that area. Uh, so not only did they conduct these surveys, but um, it was a, a part of the project was to raise awareness about Nutria, uh, hold information sessions with stakeholder groups and the public, and get the word out for reporting as well. That was also um, a part of it too. So in those surveys, uh, as I said, they were done in the Lower Mainland and in the South Coast area. Um, they had hair snare platforms as well, uh, which would also collect scat. Uh, two on those platforms, along with remote sensing cameras. So there was uh, quite a bit of training done for uh, provincial staff and stakeholders uh, throughout this process. We had a workshop with um, Dr. Shuffles and also training um, with Justin Dayton with the USDA who came out to BC and did a lot of training with staff and how to um, set up this program. And here's just a couple of uh, examples similar to the ones that you've seen in uh, Jimmy's uh, talk there. You can see the hair snares really well um, on that one on the right. And um, these are placed both in water and land. So just, oops, I skipped ahead. Just a couple extra pictures to show they were put in different locations. Um, and also you can see the bait in those ones, which were carrots. So what did they find? Uh, well, they. The results uh, from both areas uh, found quite a few other species frequenting these um, uh, bait stations, um, but no nutria were detected. So it is unlikely that, you know, in areas where there had been confirmed populations that they're all gone. However, they're likely in low numbers, um, and we certainly haven't received any recent sightings for nutria in BC. Obviously, it doesn't mean that they're not here. It just, we don't have a great grasp on where they might be anymore um, and in what numbers. So it is likely that they are in low numbers. Um, so consequently, there's no active provincial-wide control program. We would rely on reports for that um, and where a collaborative project could be you know, started if, if there's a population. But it's, potential that landowners are doing their own control, although we usually do here if anybody's experiencing, you know, property damage or environmental damage, um, but in low density, we may not be hearing about it. So that leads me um, just to my last point here is the importance of reporting. So if, even if you've seen one or you think you've seen one, even if it turns out not to be a new chair, we'd really like to hear about it. Uh, there's lots of different ways you can report, um, but through uh, the ministry environment, we have a app that you can uh, download onto your 
smartphone or other uh, device. And we also have an online form, which you can find through that link there. And you can also find the app information through that link if you haven't heard of it already. Um, the app is a little bit better because you can attach uh, photos as well. And um, that would come through to us and we can review it. And if we're not sure, we would rely on experts like Jimmy um, to help us identify uh, what the species is. And you know, our EDRR, our Early Detection Rapid Response Program really works best when uh, we hear about species, but when they're in low density. So we don't wanna reach that point where we have to run a full scale eradication program. So we'd really rather hear about them now. So with that, that's um, all I've got to speak about today. But like I said, I can take questions, um, comments, and also um, reports anytime. Feel free to reach out um, either now or later on uh, um, at any time. So thanks, Sasha. Great, thank you so much. So we do have some questions coming in. I hope uh, Jimmy's still there. He can unmute himself. I think most of the questions coming in are for you, Jimmy. So I'll go ahead and read those. Deb is wondering if they have any predators. What about coyotes? If they, yes, I mean, um, you know, vertebrate predators can take them if they get out on the land, but in, you know, just as with beaver, but they spend most of their time in the water. And um, so I don't know of any studies that have really delved into the, the predation rates of different um, predator species. So they can be taken, but it's probably pretty low. Um, okay. Next question, what to do with trapped creatures? Can you relocate them like beavers? Are they useful for fish or animal food? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So a lot of that's gonna depend on the local laws and regulations as to what you can do with them. It's generally not a recommended course of action to relocate them because you're relocating the problem. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, in some of the states that we've that I've worked in, there are state guidelines or or laws and and rules to follow that if you do catch them, they must be euthanized and disposed of. Um, so again, I would just check with your your local governments and the provincial government to to find out what's legal. Um, the state of Louisiana invested a lot of money several years ago into different things to do with nutria as they they were harvested. Um, not just for their tails for the bounty, but they developed recipes and um, use of fur guidelines and things like that. It didn't really go over well, but um, it was kind of some out of the box thinking. So, you know, the meat from them is edible if people wanted to consume a rat. Um, but yeah, there's just, uh, as far as you know, fish and animal food, as with any other you know meat source, they could be made into that. But I have no direct experience with that. Okay. Yeah, I can add, Tasha, real quick that they in BC they are a Schedule C species under the Wildlife Act, so you don't need a permit to hunt or trap them. However, there are regulations on you know how you can treat wildlife, so um, we can provide information too on animal care guidelines on on how to humanely euthanize animals. So that's something that you can reach out to as well. We can help. Thank you. Next question, can they thrive in salt water? And I think the question is coming because some of the detection points that Emily listed in her presentation look like um, they might uh, include some salt water sites. Yeah, in fact, a lot of the areas that I mentioned in coastal Louisiana, coastal Maryland and Delaware, um, they're very, you know, they're brackish water. So I'm not sure at what level salinity would negatively affect nutria, but uh, they do thrive in, in brackish areas where there is, um, you know, relatively high salinity in the water. Great. I don't see any more questions coming in the chat. Anybody have any last minute things they want to add or ask? Uh, 
All right, well, my thanks to our speakers for this very informative presentation. I have a couple of final slides that I would like to share before we adjourn. So other upcoming events, if you enjoyed this one and you want more of the same, the IACBC has a couple of webinars coming up this month. The next one, November 24th, uh, Glyphosate Myths and Facts, and the next one on November 25th on Exotic Reptiles in BC. So if you want to register for those, um, you can uh, check out the bcinvasives.ca link at the bottom for registration for those events. Coming up in 2021, particular to the Metro Vancouver region, we have a couple of online events that we don't have dates for yet, but um, you'll hear about them likely the same way that you heard about this event through our listserv or through partners. We'll be hosting our second annual land manager planning meeting and also a technical training workshop for contractors, landscapers, municipal staff, really any practitioners who are working on invasive species. So watch for those dates to come. Also some resources, if you're not aware, we have a new regional public brochure that highlights our worst invasive species. Um, you can check out our website, iscmb.ca. Again, the bcinvasives.ca website is a great resource, um, a great local resource for eco-friendly lawns and gardens in Metro Vancouver. It's really great for the public. It's growgreenguide.ca, and there's lots of information about um, sustainable gardening as well as invasive species on that site. If you're not familiar with our regional best management guides, please check them out. We have 15 completed guides and currently I'm working on the final two uh, BMPs for this series. It'll be on American bullfrog and hedge bindweed. Um, so these are technical documents um, on everything you'd wanna know about managing these 15 species in Metro Vancouver. Ways to keep in touch. So again, any of those services that I talked about in the beginning, if those are of interest to you, or if there's ways that I can support the work that you're doing, please reach out to me. Um, we're also on social media. We have a brand new YouTube channel. Um, and these are the best ways to get a hold of me. And I will pop my email into the chat right now. Um, if anybody wants to message me directly. And again, if you were not here in the beginning, I'll be sending a follow-up message to everybody registered from today with the link to the recording and any of the other resources that we have to share. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, thanks to Emily and Jimmy for your presentations, and I hope to see you again. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.